Okay, well, you know, I've always said it's not quantity, it's quality, right? So thank you for being here. We're coming down the, the shank of the event. I wanted to announce our newest distributors in Puerto Rico. Yeah. Thank you, Lynette. Look forward to coming over and visiting and getting set up. Okay, all right. So, I may have seen some of you at uh, earlier this morning, right? About curbless showers. And now we're gonna talk about permeation and isolation. Uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping points. A lot of this presentation is based on an article I wrote for Tile Letter Magazine. I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I've been there for 28 years. And the company I work for, Noble Company, um, we've been fortunate enough to be in a lot of projects, OK? In fact, if you look at the portfolio that I uh, handed out to you, you'll see this article, along with some samples of our sheet membranes, as well as some uh, relevant test data. But because I've been in Las Vegas for 28 years, 19 with Noble, we've been a part of some really fantastic projects. And I've also seen some hideous failures. So, they asked me to write an article on, gee, what kind of failures have you seen and how can we not have these failures happen again? So this is the, uh, the companion article to this presentation. As I mentioned earlier, if you have trouble sleeping tonight, just pull this out. You'll be, you'll be snoring in about three minutes, okay? Additionally, you should have, if you get involved with exterior deck membranes, exterior deck applications, which I'm sure in Puerto Rico there's a lot of those, right? Great article on how to avoid failures on your exterior decks. We've seen a lot of those, okay? So let's kind of jump into this presentation. Um, are there any, by any chance, are, are, are there any architects or specifiers here? No? That's okay. How about you in the back? You? All right, no, never mind. If you're a speci <laughs> specification. Yeah, my company is a oh, oh, great. Okay, excellent. Well, if you have your CDT certification, you're, you're familiar with this criteria, okay, or this testing methodology. If you look at a product and go, do I want to use this? You'd say, well, what are the requirements? And then based on that, what's the criteria? And then what are the tests that validate that criteria? So it's a real simple way to one, two, three, say, okay, this is a good product or maybe not so much, okay? Do we know what crack isolation is with tile and stone? We're trying to prevent tile from cracking or stone from cracking. Here were some of the early, imagine this, duct tape. Now you're laughing, but let me tell you, let me tell you, there are people in Arizona still using duct tape. They, they put duct tape over the cracks in your concrete with the idea it's gonna prevent them from coming through, okay? Now, you know what those, uh, those uh, carpet tacks are for? I don't wanna guess, why would you have carpet tacks for crack isolation? They pound the carpet tacks into the concrete so the concrete won't close again, and then they put the duct tape, okay? So here's the good news. Contractors back in the day knew that they had to stop tile from cracking, and waterproofing, if you can follow with this, if your waterproofing membrane can't handle movement, what's gonna happen? You're probably gonna have a failure leak, right? So a couple of key points I want you to walk away with today. Crack isolation and waterproofing are, are intertwined, okay? Permeation, vapor migration, steam, and waterproofing are intertwined, okay? So, when I first got my start in the tile business, I was working in Las Vegas for uh, Dal Tile. You may have heard of Dal Tile, right? And I would go see architects and they would say to me, we want the best waterproofing and crack isolation membrane there is. You know what the problem was back then? They, there were no standards. There was no, there was no industry standards. So all I could give you was, well, here's product A says this, product B says this. You couldn't really objectively evaluate it, okay? But, and I will guarantee you this right now, if we went online 25 years ago, went online today, you would see a lot of specifications read like this. Waterproofing slash crack isolation. Waterproofing slash crack suppression or joint bridging. What's my point? Much like early contractors, architects years ago, they knew crack isolation and waterproofing were tied together, okay? Remember, if your waterproof membrane can't handle movement, you're probably gonna have a failure, okay? So, here's some headlines 
$4 million. Imagine, brand new hotel in Washington, D.C. $4 million worth of shower pan failures. Okay, because either the wrong product was used or the right product was used and not put in correctly. Couldn't handle the movement. Shower pan started failing. Now, where are some of the areas of failure? A clamping ring drain, okay? Number one area. You know why? Because your membrane, whether it's sheet or liquid, ties into that mechanical fixture. And if it can't handle that movement over time, it tears and fails. Have any of you worked with linear drains at all? You there in the back. OK, linear, <laughs> linear drains you have? OK, great. Um, linear drains, look, here's a little, I'll give you a, a little small sample of linear drain. Imagine, this is a sample, but imagine four feet, six feet, eight feet of waterproofing. If you don't waterproof that correctly, you're going to have a failure. Movement joints, you know, socket joints, cold joints. Uh, number two area of failure, your shower pan meets the wall. You know why that fails? Plain transition. Concrete substrate or wood substrate, cement board, they move at different, different fa uh, phases of movement. The membrane fails. This is, a, this is actually from a forensic file. This is from Gus Belciano, TRC Consultants. And what he's, this is a shower pan. He's taking the, the drain off, OK? He's got a little mirror. You see that little uh, void right there? That's a tear. That's a liquid membrane with a tear in the, in, in the membrane. So you know what's going to happen? When that shower backs up, water is going to find a way out of that system, and you're going to have water getting to other areas, OK? We talked about linear drains. 95%, if not more, are stainless steel, OK? Nothing wrong with stainless steel, but here's one of the points about that. If you specify or pick out a linear drain of stainless steel, is marine grade important to you? Because realize the, the various things that come off and come out of the human body are very corrosive. That's why a lot of hospitals require uh, marine grade. Secondly, a lot of cleaning protocols are corrosive, OK? If you're doing a, a stainless steel drain, most times you have to use a liquid membrane. OK? And again, you better hope the guy or gal doing your, your installation puts it on thick enough, puts the correct number of coats, lets it cure. Well, here's what we found out with the, the vast migration of qualified installers out of the industry. Tasks like this aren't being done as effectively as, as it used to be. One of the solutions is there are drain manufacturers who their drain bodies are PVC or ABS. There's no concerns about um, whether it's marine grade or not. Now, in this particular example, all the stainless steel on this drain is marine grade. But this, this linear drain has a clamping mechanism that allows you to clamp down the membrane to your drain body. So what you do is you're locking with a mechanical and chemical system, locking that membrane onto the drain body. It's a lot different than painting on a liquid membrane, OK? Now, from the forensic files, remember we talked about shower pan and wall? On the back side of this image, this is a thermal image, shower pan, wall. What happened right here? That movement over time caused a tear. That, that, that meant water migrated from the shower pan into the closet areas, living spaces. Now, how real is this? There was a four-star property in a large urban metropolitan market. 2,500 rooms was experiencing hundreds, hundreds of shower pans failing at that juncture. So why am I telling you about this? In fact, let me ask you a question. The movement that happens around a drain, the movement that happens shower pan to wall, do you think it might be more than a 16th of an inch? Did I hear someone say, yes? OK, I think it is. OK, hold that thought in your mind, why that's, that's 16th of an inch, OK? Now, saw cut joints. We all know what those are for, don't we? You have fresh concrete. You do a saw cut joint in that concrete. Why? To tell the concrete where to, it's going to move, it's going to crack. You're trying to tell the concrete where to crack. But little, you might be aware of this. If you're going to do saw cut joints, you have to do them in the first 24 hours. 
If you do them day number two, day number three, it, it, it won't work because the concrete is now cured out enough where the saw cuts are, are purely cosmetic. You have to put those saw cut joints while the concrete is still, they call it plastic, okay? Now, cold joints. You ended your pour on day one right here. Day two, you come back with a fresh pour. Where those two pours meet are called a cold joint. I would write this down or, or note this to remember. Many of the legacy waterproofing and crack isolation membrane systems are not warrantied over saw cut joints or cold joints. So if you have a big, uh, big back of the house food prep kitchen, if you have a, just a big expanse of waterproofing with saw cut joints and cold joints, make sure your membrane is warranted over those details, okay? Now, expansion joint. These are what you see in, 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 in airports or, or malls. Usually they have a metal cap over them. Hard to believe some people have tried to put a membrane over that detail. It's going to fail. Now, you can, you can waterproof this, but you can't just bridge it with a liquid or sheet membrane because you have vertical and horizontal movement. Now, here's my quick plug. I think all of you know about the Tile Council of North America, right? They have all, in EJ171, in this uh, manual, they have all the movement joints you could ever be concerned about, all right? So if you're not sure whether you're a contractor, architect, or distributor, and you need to refer to movement joint details, they're in this manual, okay? Please use it. Now, again, from the forensic files, would you install anything over this whatsoever? Membrane, tile, anything? Hard to believe. Contractor was told, go ahead, we're in a hurry. Just kind of get some thin set, get some quick patch, and go over that and go to work. Well, first of all, you've got movement that's probably greater than an eighth of an inch here. You can see it. You've got vertical and horizontal movement. Uh, if you put anything over here, ceramic tile, natural stone, waterproof membrane, crack eye, it's going to fail, OK? So there are, lim there are limits. There are lots. And by the way, the reason I showed this product, this slide is, there have been, I think, unintentionally but misinformed sales reps who have told architects and contractors, oh yeah, our membrane can handle some vertical movement. There is, there is no product out there that can handle vertical movement. You have to find another solution, okay? All right, so remember our nature of attributes? The CDT uh, specification writer, way to identify. Let's just say you wanted to use product A, okay? And you wanted product A to be a great crack isolation membrane and waterproof membrane. How great do you want it to be? We want it to withstand movement up to an eighth of an inch. You know why? There's now an ANSI standard. Remember back in the day, there was no standards. There was no way to measure. Well, now, when you're reviewing, gosh, do I use product A, B, or C? High performance is eighth of an inch. Standard performance is only 16th of an inch. Remember a couple slides ago I asked you about, do you think there might be movement greater than a 16th of an inch? Of course there's gonna be, there's gonna be movement greater than a 16th of an inch. So the reason to bring that up is, if your membrane can only withstand a 16th of an inch of movement before failure, you might wanna look at high performance, and that's why we listed here. Using your nature of attributes, I want crack isolation in my waterproofing, I want to withstand an eighth of an inch of movement, what was my test? A118.12. All right, so real quickly, because most waterproofing boils down to fluid applied or sheet membranes, fluid applied are direct bond systems. Does everyone follow that? You have a paintbrush, a roller, a spray gun. You have your substrate. You spray it on. It's a direct bond. Uh, hearkening back to basic high school physics, direct bond systems tend to reflect and transfer energy more efficiently. This, that's a, kind of a fancy way of saying any kind of movement through a direct bond system will move more quickly and efficiently because it's directly bonded. Why is that important to realize? Because here's your typical detail, substrate, membrane, painted on, brushed on, rolled on, thin set, tile, movement happens for whatever reason. Thermal energy, uh, deflection, live load, dead load, who knows, the substrate's moving. And realize the movement can happen from the top or the bottom, okay? So when that movement happens, what happens? With direct bond systems, realize it's not me saying it, it's not the company I work for saying it. ANSI testing. ANSI testing bears out 
this general rule of thumb. Most liquid membranes will not meet high performance, okay? Does it mean they're inferior? Does it mean they're somehow not worthy of? All it means is every product has limitations. There is good, better, best. Liquid membranes have been used for 30 years successfully, but you should be aware there are limitations. Most liquid membranes, because they're a direct bond, will not meet high performance. All right, now, let's uh, think back. Have you ever, ever watched the uh, National Geographic Channel or World History or PBS? And they'll, they'll have some archaeological team in the Middle East or, or the Europe, and they'll find these pristine floors. They'll uncover this ancient civilization, and there's these mosaics and tile jobs with virtually unblemished, in fact, my good friend Dave Kennedy, he's back here talking. Dave went to Amalfi, Italy. He sent back images of tile. It looked brand new. I mean, it looked like it was just done last week. It was done hundreds, thousands of years ago. Well, why is that? Back in the day, these tradespeople, these craftspeople, had indirect bond. Remember, remember fluid applied, direct bond? Indirect bond, they'd have your substrate. They'd have a layer of sand, OK? a shock absorber, so to speak, all right? They would then install their toler stone over that indirect bond. What does that mean? Your finished installation of adhesive and toler stone is not directly bonded to the substrate. What happens when you have movement? That shock absorber, so to speak, absorbs that movement, diffuses it, and how, and how do we know that? If you go to ANSI 818.12, testing, and here's where I'll ask you to briefly look, look in your little portfolio. So I have a little portfolio up here, I don't want to. Pull out, pull out Noble, pull out a TS sample, okay? It's a sheet membrane sample of TS. Now, I will tell you, there are eight to 10 manufacturers of composite sheet membranes. The sample I'm showing you is just reflective of any one of these eight to 12 different manufacturers. Some are PVC, some are polyethylene, some are PB, uh, coordinated polyethylene. But the point is, take a look at that sample sideways. Kind of squint, look sideways, because you'll see a bottom layer, a middle layer, and a top layer. What is that? That's the miniaturized version of the old school sand bed. You've these manufacturers, and there's some are European, some are American. Again, there's probably eight to 10 manufacturers of composite sheet membranes. This is just one example. But what you do is, with those three layers, here's how it works. You've got a bottom layer of that sheet that bonds to your substrate. Here's your, here's your miniaturized sand bed, okay? Here's your top layer. That's an indirect bond system. What happens with indirect bond systems? They, they are able to perform at a higher rate before they fail. So as a general rule of thumb, general rule of thumb, sheet membranes tend to meet the ANSI 818.12 high performance criteria. There are a couple that don't. As a general rule, most liquids will not. That could influence your decision, what you want to use for your waterproofing and crack isolation, OK? So it's a fair question to ask. Whether you're a distributor recommending, making recommendations to your clients, whether you're a designer or an architect or a contractor, gosh, is the waterproof membrane I'm using, does it meet ANSI 818.12 for high performance? It might be a good idea if you did, because realize this article I wrote, which by the way, mentions no products. It's all about standards and testing. It's based on what I saw happening in my own backyard. Millions of dollars of failures over performance variables like this. OK, uncoupling. I'm sure we know what this means, uncoupling, right? Pretty popular concept. Uh, my own personal opinion, there's eight to 10 manufacturers making uncoupling membranes, selling hundreds of thousands of square feet. There's probably something to uncoupling, because you're not going to have that many manufacturers getting involved with something that's not going to work. But there is some confusion uh, as to what exactly is uncoupling. I've got friends who work for a variety of manufacturers who make uncoupling membranes. We're friends, we talk, it's friendly competition. But I get told things like this from my friends who work for companies who make uncoupling membranes, that it's kind of like crack isolation. It's not crack isolation, but it protects tile from cracking. That's kind of a funny one, right? Um, or it's crack isolation, and I'll ask you, somewhat rhetorically, 
If you're using uncoupling or crack isolation membranes and your goal is to have the tile not crack, is it just semantics? Realize there's something to it because you wouldn't have eight to 12 manufacturers making it. Okay, now, Webster's Dictionary, and by the way, here's two train cars coupled together. Uncoupling, to separate or disconnect, okay? Isolate, to separate. The very definitions are pretty similar, okay? Uncoupling, to separate, disconnect, isolate, to separate. So, and most times you want your train cars to stay coupled together. I'll give you a brief story. When I was in college, I worked in the iron mines. Realize, if you see the air brakes here on, this, on these train cars, there's a person who has, to, who has to crawl underneath those train cars and hook those, unhook those air brakes. That was me. Okay, and so because I was a young guy, the totem pole, and I will tell you, as I was under those rail cars, I would hear them move. Okay, I would ask my boss, am I safe down there? He'd say, don't worry, these aren't gonna uncouple, you're safe, okay? I'll, I'll, give you, I'll shorten the story for you. We came into work one Monday, guess what? The air brakes failed, train cars uncoupled, and they were smashed together at the end of the rail yard. Now, in your evaluation process, are there accepted methods of installation for uncoupling in TCNA? Yes, there are. And that is good, okay? Tile Council of North America recognizes uncoupling as a valid source of installation with seven different, different methods. Now, are there any, remember we talked about ANSI standards? Remember ANSI A18.12 for crack isolation? Are there any ANSI standards for uncoupling? No. Are there any ISO standards? For uncoupling? No. So we go to our nature of attributes, okay? Let's just say you're, you're bound to determine you want to use uncoupling on your next project. What are the requirements? I want uncoupling. Whatever that is, I want it. Criteria, none available. Testing, none available. Now at first glance you might think, oh wait, I shouldn't use these products, but let's harken back to there's eight to 12 manufacturers making this product. Thousands of square feet been installed successfully. There's probably something to it. So in the meantime, what some manufacturers have done, they will use A118.12 as a testing methodology to identify how their products do, okay? Okay, permeation, steam, vapor migration. Let's acknowledge that we build our buildings much more efficiently. Uh, back in the day, uh, they weren't quite as airtight. But now with our construction methods, buildings don't breathe like they used to. Now on top of that, you've got uh, people taking showers forever. Showers have become a source of the oasis, the refuge, uh, your, your escape from the real world. What happens? We're having a real issue with vapor migration as it makes its way through the shower system. If you don't have a membrane to stop that movement from happening, it's gonna get back into your stud wall cavities. You're gonna have microbial growth, which is a fancy term for mold. Now, here's sort of the, uh, the uh, case study. Have, some of you, have any of you been to Las Vegas at all in the last four or five years, Las Vegas, yes? Okay, our newest distributor in Puerto Rico has, okay. Um, anyway, Project City Center was the nation's largest privately funded project, $11 billion, okay? MGM Mirage, HKS, Gensler, Leo Daly, they were not going to have your typical shower pan, vapor migration issues. They hired their own forensic team to study why does this happen? How can we stop it? And so their own team of forensic experts, risk mitigation attorneys, waterproof consultants, came back to MGM Mirage and said, you know what? Most, most hospitality these days has so much steam being produced, vapor, same is true of student housing, same is true of health clubs and some hospitals. So much steam is produced, they resemble mini steam room environments, okay? So the solution is pretty obvious. If you're dealing with environments that resemble mini steam rooms, you have to have a membrane on the wall that is of a steam room quality. So I apologize, I haven't fixed this slide, it's my bad. What's your solution? I would write this down. I would make a mental note. When you want to put a membrane on the wall and you want that membrane to effectively block vapor migration, ASTM E96, but it's procedure E. ASTM E96, procedure E. 
What does that tell a contractor or your client or, or anyone who gets involved in waterproofing? That tells them whoever's product they use, you want a quality that is essentially a steam room level of quality on your walls. Now, some quick numbers for comparison. There are some membranes out there that approach this. Point one, that's just about impermeable, okay? So you draw that out across the chart, 10, 10 showers, roughly 1,000 square feet of, of, of wall tile. In a week's time, we'll have about two water bottles worth of steam. That's negligible. That's nothing. You don't worry about that. Now, you move on down the chart. There are some legacy systems for waterproofing that are closer to 2, 2.2, 2.5. How does that translate out? Same 1,000 square feet, week's time, two to two and a half gallons of vapor migration. Now that's something you should be concerned about. So in looking at your own best practices, if you're a tile contractor, and looking at what you recommend to your uh, customers if you're a distributor, uh, or if you're an architect or you're a arch uh, spec writer, ASTM E96 is not proprietary, it's not closed-ended, but if you instill that as your benchmark of performance, you're ensuring that what goes on the walls is not going to allow steam to migrate into your stud wall cavities. Now, back to our uh, forensic horror shots. This is an infrared camera. And by the way, I'll, I'll share with you, for those of you who are techies, you know you can now get an infrared attachment for your iPhone for about 400 bucks. For about 400 bucks, you get images real close to this in case you're really curious what's going on. Because this is a thermal image being shot at a shower assembly, and this, those dark areas are mold. You can't see them. They're in, the, they're in the back. They're inside. That's exactly the area you don't want that to be because vapor migrates through the, through the ceramic tile, through the, by the way, if the membrane on the wall can't stop vapor migration, it passes through the membrane and eventually finds a food source. Now you have that mold, okay? Now, I will tell you this in Las Vegas, when you leave Las Vegas, there are billboards that say, were you hurt? Were you somehow injured in a hotel? There are literally lawyers looking to find people who maybe they slipped and fell, or maybe they have a compromised immune system and they were in a hotel that had black mold and now they can sue the hotel. Um, black mold can be deadly, can really affect someone negatively if they have a compromised immune system. Now, look at this, here's, here's the, um, the headlines. Hotels and high rises try proactive mold prevention. I think I mentioned earlier, there are 1,000 cases plus today active in Southern California related to mold, okay? And typical residential or commercial applications. So what's proactive mold prevention? Well, if you're an architect, a contractor, and maybe if you're a contractor, you go to your GC or your owner and go, hey, you know what? I don't really feel like being on this job in four years talking about you know, black mold in the stud walls. Maybe you get the upcharge. Or maybe you cover yourself by at least suggesting, Mr. Owner, Mr. GC, you really need a membrane of this quality on your walls. But what's really telling is, please note who wrote the article. That's a legal firm, OK? And that's, what's, that's where you're going to wind up. If you're part of the construction process where black mold ends up on those stud, inside those stud wall cavities and you were the tile contractor or the architect or the general, there's a good chance you'll be deposed and be part of that whole legal process. You want to try to avoid that. I don't know if we have time here for our... Let's we'll see if we can squeeze this in here. Uh, on, on that computer, can you ac activate the play button? No, on the play button right here. Okay, now this closely resembles a real life experience of my own. I was in Las Vegas. I was called one day by this forensic waterproof consulting firm. And they said, Dean, why don't you come up to floor number 22 of building XYZ? And I get there and I encounter two gentlemen just like this. Biohazard suits, respirators, and it gets, it gets better or worse. They have the boy in the bubble pressurized room, okay? And then, and then he said, hey, well, come on in and check this out. I'm like dressed like this. I go, you know, guys, thank you very much, but uh, you're dressed like you're going to the moon, and I'm dressed in my golf tee, so I'm going to hang back. But nonetheless, what had happened in this four-star property is that 
there was alleged concerns about potential microbial growth, microbial growth in, the, uh, in the rooms. And so they had to shut down a whole floor and start this kind of investigation. And what, the, what he's doing here is he's literally having the, there's, there's spores you can't even see that are being generated by activity around black mold. And so he's kind of trying to spray to knock some of that spores in the air, knock that activity down. And then they start their forensic examination. Now, in the project that I was on, eventually, as they went through this process, of course, for those of you who have ever had a home, home remodeling project, ever had this happen where you say, I'm going to have this little project, and I'm going to start over here. I'm going to fix this one little thing. And as you go, you peel it back. And you go, oh, 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 man. Oh, oh. Pretty soon you realize, you know what? I have to redo everything. The whole thing is, is just is shot. Well, you know, and here they're displaying what they've revealed so far. And uh, this, could be, you know, this could be potentially, if you were in the back of the house area of a hotel, when I say back of the house, this could be the employee corridors. Uh, on the other side, it could be a food prep kitchen or a laundry facility. Whatever is generating a lot of steam, steam migrates to the stud wall cavities. And eventually, what happens here, kind of like that home remodeling project gone to pot, um, as, you, <laughs> as they go higher and higher up, it reveals more and more damage. In the case of the projects uh, that I was uh, re reviewing, they eventually had to redo every shower in that hotel. Okay, Very expensive process. Um, and the point of that whole little video is, you know, originally this project had a waterproofing system and a membrane system in place that would have probably prevented this. But someone wanted to save a little money. Someone wanted to, you know, was bound to determine that maybe over something for 15 or 20 cents a square foot, less expensive, we better. And that combined with inferior workmanship caused a horrible scenario like that. And can, I, can we bounce off that slide? Okay, so nature of attributes, come down the home stretch here. You want to use a product that's going to stop vapor from migrating into your stud wall cavities. That's your, that's your requirement. I don't want to worry about black mold. Okay. What's the criteria? Perm rating must be 0.5 or lower. Why is that number important? That's a steam room level of quality, OK? What's the testing to validate the criteria? ASTM E96 Procedure E. Again, my bad. I apologize. ASTM E96 Procedure E. But there you go. One, two, three. Requirements, criteria, testing to validate it. So I would suggest on projects where you're concerned about vapor migration, get a product that meets that kind of standards of performance, OK? Hawaii, real quickly, I'll tell you this, tropical, moist, the trade winds, much different than Las Vegas, but you know what? They've had issues there. A, a major hotel developer built a tower. A year later, it was shut down. Why? Black mold. Now, I will tell you this developer now, as common protocol, every day, every week, every project, uses a membrane that meets ASTM E96 Procedure E. So it doesn't matter whether you're in Las Vegas, dry as a bone, two inches of rain a year, or Honolulu or Waikiki, where it's very tropical. These mold issues are very real, can be very, very expensive and very unhealthy, potentially life-threatening. So what do you want to do? We're wrapping this thing up here. Please, the takeaways are this. Crack isolation and waterproofing are intertwined. When you select a product for waterproofing, look at the ANSI A18.12 high performance or standard performance attributes to decide what you need. Secondly, permeation, vapor migration, again, is intertwined with the success of your waterproof membrane. Okay, so if you want to minimize concerns, minimize potential risks of vapor migration, black mold, litigation, etc., choose a membrane, and there are more than one out there, that meets ASTM E96 Procedure E. By all means, keep yourself uh, up to date with your ANSI standards, ASTM standards as they change and evolve. And of course, contact your local, your local uh, vendor, your local tech rep. Stay in touch, stay up to date with what's going on. Uh, some session evaluations if you want to take a look at those. I want to thank you very much for stopping by. We're in booth 7903. Appreciate your time and have a great rest of the uh, conference. Thank you. Bye-bye.